I'm Sherilyn Skolnicki, and this is Brilliant Balance, the show for working women who are ready to shine. Each week, I bring you ideas, inspiration, and insight on balance, business, and getting it all done gracefully. You ready? Let's be brilliant. This is episode 169 of the Brilliant Balance podcast, how to read more this year. So I think I need to start this episode with an admission, an honest admission that I have always been an avid reader. It goes all the way back to when I was very young, and my mom used to take me to the library in our little town all the time. I mean, I don't think I would be exaggerating to say it was a near daily event um, when I was very young to go to the library, read the books that were there, take books home with us, bring them back the next day, start over again. It was just an unbridled passion. I remember, and I think I've told this story before, in grade school, we used to have this reading contest that would culminate in earning balloons, helium-filled balloons for the number of books you'd read. And then you could release these balloons. And again, this was before we knew that this was not so good for the birds. And I just remember sort of standing under this umbrella or, or you know, parachute of balloons um, because I had so much fun. No one was forcing me to read. No one was begging me to read or, you know, it. W- I didn't have to be bribed. It was just a delight to lose myself in those stories. And at that time, I think I read predominantly fiction. You know, as a kid, you'd kind of always find me draped across an armchair or sprawled out on my bed, just, you know, my nose in a book. And this did not go away as I grew up. As a 20-something, there was no better Friday night than tucking myself into a Barnes and Noble, you know, at dusk with a latte and a stack of books, just walking up and down those aisles, skimming through things, choosing a couple to take home with me. It was such a pleasure. And as a frequent flyer early in my career, when I traveled just a ton, I I think Every flight I spent time in that airport bookstore before I got on the plane trying to pick a couple of things to take with me on the trip. And that just is not, it's not a pastime or a passion that has faded, but I will say that it has gotten harder to carve out and protect time to read as I have had children and those children have become more active and their needs go longer into the night, you know, there's just, there is less discretionary time for anything and therefore less time for reading. But it is 100% still my preferred method of learning. Like if I need to go deep on something, kind of, I'll say, if I need to get smart about something quickly, I'm going straight to books, you know, and I may read five to 10 books on a subject just to sort of get a good survey of of the landscape on that subject matter. It's my preferred form of entertainment, all else being equal. I would choose to read over, you know, watching TV or anything else. And so because people know this, I get asked a lot about how I manage to read when life is so full, you know, with the kids and my husband and the business and and other responsibilities, how do you do it? And I understand the question. I did a little bit of research on this to understand how much do we read? And it turns out when you add up all the books that, at least in America, that Americans read over the course of a year, it's an average of about 12 books per year per reader. But that has some noise in the data. And so if you really look at what most Americans do, they read about four books a year. So you can look at your own reading habits and kind of see where you stack up, right? Are you reading more than average, less than average? And how do you feel about that? And I thought that since I get asked this question so much, it might make an interesting episode, especially because I know some of you have shared with me that you are trying to read more. And so 
I want to get into, I, I spent some time with a notebook. I chatted with my family. I chatted with my team at work to see if we could really get underneath, like, what is the mechanism that allows at least me to read as much as I do? And, and could that translate into some ideas that you might be able to reapply? And I, I will tell you, I had a lot of fun putting this episode together. So I, I can't wait to hear some of your feedback on what you take away from it and what you choose to try. And does it help? Does it help you read more? Because I think that would be awesome if as a community of brilliant women, we committed to reading more of the great stuff that's being created every year and just the volume upon volume upon volume of great work that's already been published, that's just there waiting for you to discover. So I am breaking this episode up into kind of three categories, what to read, and then when and where to read, and then how to read. So despite my aversion to this term, that's kind of the tips and tricks section of this episode. So let's start with what to read. And my my counsel to you would be to follow your curiosity. You know, when you, especially when you think about nonfiction, what do you personally want to know more about, right? What has captured your imagination or your curiosity where you just wonder, you know, how did that come to be? How did that historical event really go down? What was that person like? How does this scientific principle, you know, unfold. When you think about the things you see in the world that you don't fully understand, but you want to, that's your curiosity. And that is a great place to start when you're thinking about what you might want to read. So you could then do things like go to a bookstore and go to that section. You could go to a library, like an actual real library, talk to the librarian about this area you're interested in. You could Google that subject and see which books are recommended. You can go to Amazon and see which books are recommended. There's a lot of ways in to kind of find material to read once you have a subject identified, in especially in nonfiction, that you might want to learn more about. Okay. And if nothing is popping up for you, my favorite recommendation would be go to a physical bookstore you know, an independently owned bookstore or a chain, and just give yourself permission to browse. Browse the sections and see what grabs your attention. Something will captivate you. Something in that store will will captivate your attention, and that's where you can start, okay? Another idea for figuring out what to read is to use a service like Goodreads where you can follow other people and see their reading progress and get their recommendations. You can read reviews of books that way. You can kind of find people whose tastes are similar to yours and get recommendations from them. You also, if you don't want to use Goodreads, could follow people on like Instagram who read a lot and talk about what they read and then screenshot their recos, right? So we we all have heard of Oprah's book club. Reese Witherspoon has a book club within Hello Sunshine. A number of people have book clubs and recommendations that they regularly share ideas of things you may want to read. And so again, once you find someone who has similar taste, that is a great place to go. And what I typically do is just start screenshotting their recos when they come up. I keep all those in one place. And then when I'm looking for inspiration on what to read next, I can go back to those screenshots and look at those titles. And what that lets you do when we're thinking about what to read is that lets you always have a book queue right? Always have a roster of books that you're waiting to read. So you're never at that place where you're like, I just don't know what I want to read. You know, I know I want to read more, but I don't have anything to read. So there is always, and I mean always, a stack of books, paper books typically, like actual hard books, on my nightstand. My Kindle which I'll talk about in a little bit later in this episode, always has a number of books already downloaded and ready to go. And I typically have a number of books on hold at the library, either in physical copies or digital copies like eBooks. 
And if you're not signed up for a service like that with the library, that is a fantastic way to get started because sometimes people will tell me, I just don't like to buy books because then I have all this money invested in them and I don't always finish them or what am I going to do with it after I've read it? Look, I think we should buy books. I think we should support authors. I'm a big believer in that. People should get paid for their work. But I also think the library is a fabulous tool when you're a voracious reader to allow you to explore things without that same risk, without feeling like, oh, what if I don't love it, right? So if you don't have a library card, you haven't figured that out, it's a great time to go rediscover your library. Okay, so those were a couple thoughts on what to read. Follow your curiosity, specifically in nonfiction. Get recommendations, specifically in fiction, but also in nonfiction always have a book queue, right? Always have material that you can pick up and read. I'm sitting here recording this episode, looking around the room, and there are no fewer than four stacks of books on small tables around this room. So, I mean, I could reach out and pick up a book at any any moment. All right. The next thing that I think we should talk about is when and where to read. In other words, how are we going to schedule this? Because we know that what gets scheduled gets done. And if we're not going to schedule it, or if we're insufficient in scheduling, what are some other places to pick up some reading minutes right throughout the week? So the first thing I would say is much like any other habit that you're trying to build, right? whether it's meditation or exercise or one-on-one time with your children or time to practice the piano, right? Any habit you are trying to build, you are going to be carving that time away from something else that you're already doing so that you can give it to this new habit, right? It's just scientific. If you want to start meditating, you've never been someone who meditates, Those minutes are getting allocated to some other activity and you have to redirect them. So too with reading, okay? So if you want to regularly read, we need to find a time in your day that is currently going to some other activity that you are going to repurpose for reading. The two most popular times of day, and I'm going to add a third that's less popular, two most popular times of day, well, I take that back. The number one most popular time of day would be bedtime. So most people who I know who read regularly use it as a wind-down activity, right? It's everything else is done. I am finally climbing under those covers. I'm turning on a very dim light, and I'm opening that book, right? Or I'm turning on that ebook. That is far and away the most popular time I know when when people are going to regularly schedule time to read. A second time that I think is genius would be during a break in your day. So for example, if you take a lunch and you don't regularly go out to lunch or or spend that lunch time socializing with other people, that could be a regular block of time that you choose to read. And you could get 30 minutes in, which is, I, I promise you, most people are not reading any longer than 30 minutes at night before they fall asleep. You could get 30 minutes in during a midday break and have it be really pleasurable. Because what are you doing now, probably? Catching up on email, scrolling through social media, right? Chit chat at the water cooler if you're in an office. So, this is a really maybe hidden gem of a day part that you could repurpose for reading. The third one, I don't use because I have other things slotted into this time period, but I think this is also a really good one, and it's first thing in the morning. So you know how sometimes you don't want to get out of bed, right? Like the alarm goes off and you think, oh, I just don't want to get out of bed. And often we're trying to go work out or do something or we're trying to hit the ground running. Well, I got this idea from Hugh Jackman, of all people, who said that this is the first thing he does in the morning. He gets up, he makes a cup of coffee or tea, I can't remember which, and comes back to bed and then reads for a chunk of time first thing in the morning. I think that sounds lovely. Like, I think that sounds like a fantastic idea that especially if you're like, I'm already awake, I can't fall back asleep, but I really don't want to get up and do something like super active. What a great way to ease into the day. So I'll offer up those three as 
regular times of day that might be repurposed for reading. Ever feel like instead of you running your week, your week is running you? I know, we've all been there. Too often it feels like time is racing by and we're just struggling to keep up. But listen, it doesn't have to be this way. Let me help you take control of your calendar once and for all. Get my downloadable guide and learn how you can align your time with your priorities and get a handle on your never-ending to-do list. Head over to brilliant-balance.com forward slash calendar to download your guide and get control over your calendar starting today. The second thing I think about, and when I was talking to my family about my own reading habits, they were like, this is your superpower. You do this definitively. And it's using what I call the spaces in between to read. So this could be you know, you are picking up a child from school and you have to wait in the parking lot for 10 minutes because you're there early and it's they haven't come out of the building yet, right? There's 10 minutes that you can read. You could have a dentist appointment and instead of reading the magazine that they've put in the waiting room, you have your book with you and there's 10 or 15 or 20 minutes that you can read. If we're traveling, remember when we traveled? You know, if you were getting on an airplane, there is so much time associated with air travel. I I used to be able to get a whole book done from the time that I would arrive at the airport until I physically got into like an Uber or a taxi or whatever, because you'd have your waiting in security. I can read in the security line. You're waiting at the gate right for what seems like eons you get on the plane and you can't turn on your devices so you but you can read the second you get on the plane you can read all the way until you get off the plane right there's so many little spaces in between that you can grab to be able to read incrementally to that regularly scheduled reading time if you're trying to read more right recapturing those little spaces third thing you could read instead of other consumption habits, what I'll call consumption habits, like watching TV, reading things on social media, reading news sites, you know, even listening to podcasts. Like you can read instead of other kinds of consumption. So I candidly do not watch a lot of TV. Do not ask me about the latest hot show. I probably have not seen it. But This is one of the things that I am likely doing instead of regularly watching TV, okay? And the fourth thing is to read as what I would call a scheduled leisure activity. Now, that almost sounds like an oxymoron. I realize it. But I've I've really tried for this episode to be pretty analytical about this. I hope you can hear that. So reading as a scheduled leisure activity, what do I mean by that? I mean, you know, it's a beautiful summer day and you decide to pour yourself a big glass of ice water or a cocktail or a lemonade and go sit on your patio and get some sun and just read, right? Or it's a cozy winter's day and it's snowing outside and you turn on the fireplace and you get a blanket and a cup of tea and you sit down to read. Like it's a scheduled leisure activity just because you love it. That's another way to get a chunk of time that can be dedicated to reading. So just to recap these when, where ideas, we had a regular time every, pretty much every day that you may try to read using the spaces in between, like when you're waiting to pick up a kid or you're at the doctor's office, reading instead of other consumption activities like watching TV or social media, and then reading as a scheduled leisure activity where you do it with purpose. Those are all ways that can help you increase the number of minutes you're reading, and therefore you can read more, okay? So all of those things that we just talked about require you to spend more time, right? To to carve time away from other things and repurpose it toward reading. And I fully recognize that that may be a challenge and you might be feeling some resistance to reading because of that. So this next section, I want to talk about how to read. What are some of the tips and tricks that could allow you to just get some ease in the process to make it a little bit easier, okay? First thing I would say here is find your favorite format to 
to read. So is it hardcover books? And you just, man, when you have a hardcover book, you can't wait to pick it up and because it feels important and new, right? Is it paperback because it's a little more lightweight and you can bend the pages back and you feel less guilty about writing notes in the margins? Is it ebooks like a Kindle or an iPad? Where when you read on those, you feel like you're not, you know, hurting the environment because you're not going through all this paper and it's more portable and you can have several books accessible at the same time. You want to really pay attention to what is calling your name. I love a paper book. I love the feel of a hardback. I love the look and the feel of a hardcover book. But I will say in the last couple of years, and especially in 2020, with all the events of COVID and quarantine, ebooks became my number one go to. And the reason is because two things. One, they are super portable, right? My Kindle Paperwhite can fit in my purse. Like it's so tiny and so lightweight, and it can hold as many books as I want, which makes it exceptionally useful for things like travel. Right. So if I I think about those days when I used to get on an airplane for a long trip and I would have several books with me. The weight in my suitcase with this pile of books that I was taking on vacation was like ridiculous. And now, you know, to take everything on a Kindle, it's just so easy. Um, And that is not the only e reader, it is the one that I use and I love it. But if you're going to use an ebook, find a device that you love. I read on an iPad mini for years. And until I got the Kindle, which is even lighter, and there are pros and cons to those two approaches, but I love reading on an e-reader now. And here's the thing that really made me a convert. I am like a habitual, I don't know what word to use here, chronic underliner, highlighter, notes in the margin person, right? I learned a long time ago, it's my book, I can write whatever I want in there. And I used to think like, well, I have to have the book to be able to go back and find those notes. Like, I didn't like the idea that they would sort of disappear into the ether with an e-reader. But guess what? If you don't already know this, you're going to love this. You can download your highlights. If you're reading on a Kindle, which again is the device I use, if you go to, and I'll put this in the show notes, but if you go to read.amazon.com, forward slash notebook, all of the things you have highlighted are there. So there's like the page number that you highlighted it on and the paragraph that you highlighted or the sentence you highlighted, and it's just right there for you. And then you can export that to whatever other format you want. I put all mine to Evernote. Phenomenal tool. So now if I'm curious about what were my highlights from that book that I read last June, I just go right to that file and I can find my highlights. It is That is a fantastic little tip around e-readers. So find your favorite format was this point. The second thing that I think is really important that we acknowledge is if you want to read more, the faster you read, the more you're going to read. Okay, so finding a way to build speed can really be a game changer. And full disclosure, I do this naturally there i am a very fast reader it is part of why i can read so much i am not able to break down how i read quickly but i went and did some homework on this to find what i think is the best resource i've seen on how to build speed in reading and i think tim ferriss's approach is genius so i'm going to link it for you in the show notes And if you are trying to build speed in reading and you're willing to kind of buckle down for a short period of time and see if you can increase your speed, this approach is phenomenal. Really, it's focused on a couple of things. It's focused on really where do your eyes go while you are reading a page. We all have something called fixations when we're reading. It's kind of like where does your eye stop and almost snapshot what it's seeing? And if you can minimize the number of fixations that you have and how long each fixation lasts, you can read faster, okay? And he gets into a whole process for this in this guide. The second thing is you have to stop (laughs) rereading. You have to stop going back and being like, wait, let me reread that sentence again. 
or let me skip back and and reread this part. That really slows you down. And it's it's a habit that a lot of us got into when 100% recall was critical, right? We were going to be tested on this material. And so we learned to read for full comprehension, but for speed that is that is a really slows you down, okay? And then the third thing has to do with peripheral vision. How many words can you kind of register mentally at one time? So if you want to nerd out with me on this, Tim Ferriss's approach is the way to go. I'm going to put it in the show notes for you. and it, Or if you just want to go to tim.blog and search for speed reading, you'll find it. But it is th- that is an exceptional approach if you, are, again, are willing to say like, all right, I'm going to press pause for a little bit here in my life. I'm going to do this exercise, right? It's not going to take you that long. And I'm going to see if I can increase my reading speed. And the data that he has is people are like 10xing their reading speed using this technique. So you're welcome. I hope you get a lot out of that one. Third thing I would say in terms of tips and tricks and how do you read is I want you to give yourself permission to break the rules. You you may have to give yourself permission to do a number of unconventional things in order to read more. This is where my perfectionistic listeners are going to need to really pay attention because you might find that you're doing some things that you think you have to do and they're slowing you down. Okay, as an example, give it, I mentioned one earlier, right? Giving yourself permission to highlight or underline really can help you move on. Like there's something about knowing, all right, I've highlighted that, I've noted it. I I don't have to go back and reread it a thousand times because it's already going to be in my highlights. I can reread it anytime I want. I'm not trying to memorize it. You, for example, can give yourself permission not to finish a book. If you start a book and it's not working for you and this isn't what you thought it was going to be and you're not learning something or being entertained, ditch it. Right? There's no rule that says you have to finish. So, what sometimes happens is we pick a book, we say, no matter what, I'm going to finish this book, and we hate it. And then, do we want to read another one? No, because it was torture. So, we want to get to a place where you are enjoying the process of reading. And that means sometimes you have to give yourself permission not to finish. In the same vein, giving yourself permission to skip pages. You know, up oh, looks like this is an anecdote that I don't really need to read. Up oh, looks like this is a summary of key points from that chapter, which I just read. And I'm, again, not trying to take a test on this, so I can skip that synopsis of key points. So skipping pages is a way to more quickly finish a book and still get the idea, right? You may have to give yourself permission to read ahead, which I know is like heresy, but the table of contents is your friend. So if you're reading especially nonfiction, right, this doesn't work so well for fiction because you'd give up the plot, but if you are reading nonfiction, there may be a particular section of that book that is of extreme interest to you and some sections that are of no interest at all. So guess what? It's okay to read the part that's relevant to what you're trying to learn about. All of those are tips and tricks and hacks. They're ideas to help you just get more reading under your belt, to make it pleasurable, enjoyable, and not so heavy as you're going through the activities, okay? All right, I think those are the things I wanted to share. So let's just recap a bit. If you are standing here saying, I really want to read more, then knowing what to read, when and where you're going to read, And how you read, especially how you read quickly, is going to make a difference. So these ideas that I shared today are all designed to help you get more books under your belt this year. And I really want you to apply what I shared today. So I would love to hear from you. And Here's what I want you to do. Whatever you are reading now or whatever you decide to read next, right? If you're going to take action based on what I've shared today, take a picture of either you reading the book or just the book, and post it on Instagram. And then tag my accounts, tag at cskolnicki and at brilliant underscore balance. And we will repost your recos. So this community can start to share things that we're reading, fiction and nonfiction. Okay? I will do the same. So I'll share what I'm reading, you share what you're reading, and we'll see what this community is up to. 
And I can't wait. I can't wait to see. Maybe we'll have to start our own book club at some point. But I would love to see what you're reading and how you are putting these techniques to good use. That's all for today, my friends. Until next time, let's be brilliant. This is the podcastfactory.com.